Church, uh, this morning, I am not speaking. Um, I, we brought in uh, Pastor Chris, for our students, pastor from our, our, our campus in Burbank. Christopher Rodriguez is going to be speaking, and I know uh, God has a big word for us. He's going to be closing out our series Carpool. How many, raise your hand if you enjoyed, if you enjoyed the series Carpool. How to do life with one another, right? It's been incredible. But Pastor Chris, please uh, come on up here and uh, let's give him a big round of applause for coming down from Burbank. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Amen. Um, love that song. Love the thing for the worship team, just uh, kind of setting us everything up today. Um, good morning, South Hills Riverside. How's everyone feeling today? Good, good. It's really great to be with you all. Uh, I'm always so happy to be able to see you guys um, and just be able to share a moment with you guys. And so a special welcome as well to everyone who may be watching online. And um, a special thank you as well to uh, Pastors Ozzy and Anna. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, speak with you all today. So let us begin with just a short word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, God, first and foremost uh, for this day of life, Lord. I thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come together uh, for a few moments, God, under one roof, Lord, under your roof. We thank you, God, for the opportunity, for the privilege it is, God, to, to be able to join together in this carpool, Lord, and the fact that we don't have to go through uh, this incredible journey of life alone, Lord. You have people who you have sent uh, to be with each of us, to speak to us, Lord, and we just ask, God, today that you would fill this room with your spirit, Lord. I ask, Father, that I would become less so that your word would become greater, Father. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you ever watch the news and you think to yourself, if I were president or if I were that congressman, things would be in a much better situation. Or maybe you're watching your favorite sports team, and you think to yourself, man, if, that was, if I was that receiver, I would definitely not have fumbled. I think to myself sometimes I'm watching you know, uh, sports, I'm thinking politics, and all these things are so uh, hyper-competitive, right? And I think to myself, you know, uh, if I were in that position, I wouldn't have fumbled. I wouldn't have dropped the ball. I wouldn't have um, let things get so out of hand, right? Personally, I think... Uh, you know, Congress is so competitive, they might as well wear uh, jerseys. Um, that way we also would know who their sponsors are. That's, an, that's a it's political joke. You can laugh. It's an election year. So that's it. Personally, I think that um, we all have these moments, right? We think like, man, if I, were, if I were the driver, if I weren't in the back seat, right, we'd be getting there a lot quicker. We wouldn't have to deal with so much traffic. And when you think about all these things, we think about what is our role, Right? What is our role in, in this journey, right? We talk about in this journey of life. You know, and maybe we're in the backseat today, but we want to be in a different role. We want to be in the passenger. We want to be the driver, maybe any of these kind of things. And today, as Pastor Aldi said, we are wrapping up our series, Carpool, for the month of March. And we've been discussing over these past few weeks the life we were meant to live and what that actually means to each of us. We've been discussing why many of us may not find it useful or reasonable to go through life with others. So um, some of us prefer to go it alone. We prefer to just be in the driver's seat. Comfort is so important to us and that we're willing to trade connections with other people just so that we can be comfortable. We don't have to get out of our comfort zone, right? And involving other people in our life decisions, um, I acknowledge that it can be a complicated, messy, even an exhausting process, right? And so today, specifically, we are, uh, our title for today's message is Know Your Stop. Know Your Stop. So here's the thing. You are not part, 
you're not just a part of God's plan A to reach the world. You are plan A. There is no plan B. There is no backup plan. And this realization, when you understand this, it can feel overwhelming. It can feel scary. It can feel intimidating. But the thing is, and the good news about that is that we don't have to change anything dramatically or drastically to step into that role or to step into our role in God's plan. We don't have to change careers, memorize every bit of scripture. We don't have to go into seminary. We don't have to become missionaries and travel to another side of the world to step into this role that God has for us. In fact, for most of us, it means staying exactly where we are right now. So what part do we have to play in this plan? And more specifically, what is God inviting us to do with that? See, the tension here and the struggle with understanding this concept, accepting this concept of a plan, is that we have a tendency, including myself, to compare ourselves to someone else, right? Immediately, once we are given a role, and this can be in work, this can be in in life, we're immediately comparing ourselves to the, next per- to the person next to us. Theodore uh, Roosevelt, our 26th president of the United States, he said this uh, very famous quote, comparison is the thief of joy. Why is that? Why is it a bad thing? See, what we don't often, often realize with comparison, the downfall to it, is not just the obvious, not that we just tend to envy each other, but we actually give ourselves permission to not do certain things. And what I mean by that is, for example, I don't have to act a certain way because no one actually knows me. I don't need to prioritize my time better because I've got my own responsibilities. Or what about this? What about in the church? I just attend church, so I don't actually have to serve. I'm here, right? Maybe you are volunteering. But you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm not staff, so I don't actually have to change my life around. I'm not the pastor, so I don't have to be prepared to give a word to somebody else. We look at each other, we may think to ourselves, well, if I were only as spiritual as the person next to me, oh, I'd be a much better person then. But I have to be that spiritual first. The tension is, again, that that's not what God wants for us. That's not what God tells us to step into. Now, there are a few reasons why we think this way, right? And, and the blame, the burden is not just on ourselves. A lot of us, we were brought up to experience this and to know this kind of reality. And if we even look into the early church, right, we always start by looking at ourselves first, right? And when we look into early Christianity and we think about the fact that uh, at a certain point when Christianity became the official religion of Rome around 380 AD, this is what happened. The church moved from meeting in the privacy and intimacy of people's homes, and they moved into these large, grandiose cathedrals, right? And so the good thing about this change was the normalization of the faith, the acceptance of the Jewish people, of Christians. That was a good thing. It introduced a new type of leadership model, that many still experience to this day, where there would be one designated person who was best able to communicate directly with God, often on the behalf of others, right? And we look to, we think about these things. People just show up and they rely on a priest or they rely on the Pope to speak on their behalf. But I would argue, respectfully, I would argue That in that change, in that shift, there was tremendous loss. Tremendous loss. But we can't take my word for it, right? We need to go to Scripture. We need to see what does Jesus tell us about our role in the church, in our life, and in faith. So I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles, open up your Bible apps. We're going to turn to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit 
comes on you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This scripture, this verse in specific, happens to be our verse of the year for South Hills. Pastor Moses selected this and he presented this to us recently. And here, Luke, Luke is recounting the final instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples before his ascension to heaven. And he specifically mentions three places by name, right? He mentions Jerusalem, which is the place where Jesus was wrongfully executed. Judea is the place where his ministry was rejected. And Samaria, this was known as to being a home of impure half-breeds. See, that the Gentiles were seen by the Jews at that time of the early world as being nothing better than dogs or pigs. That's what they called them. And yet, despite all these realities of this, this incredible shift that's happening, Jesus commands that he would have witnesses be sent to each of these places. So I'm going to give you three key points that gives you hopefully a little bit of insight into how we can identify our role in his plan. So our first point, Jesus called for witnesses. Jesus called for witnesses. Now, Pastor Moses describes it as this. He says that we should view this verse, and when we ask ourselves, how do we apply it to ourselves, we look at it this way. Jerusalem is our home. Jerusalem is our home. This is the people that we come into contact with on a daily basis, our friends, our closest of friends, our family members. Judea is our community. These are the people that you run into when you're going about your business, right? These are neighbors. This is your barista. Is it barista? I don't, I don't drink coffee, so I don't really know exactly how to pronounce it. But Samaria, this is the place where we normally wouldn't go into, maybe even the place we try to avoid, full of the people that we don't actually like all that much or that we disagree with most. Different interests, different hobbies, different uh, positions, right? Different beliefs. So my question to you is, who did Jesus say would be his witness? And you can respond if you like. Did he say it was to be the priests? Did he say it was to be the pope? Did he say it would be only his teachers? Jesus talks about this and answers this in his very first sermon. If we turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, chapter 5, verses 14 through 16 says this, You are the light of the world. You are a town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In this passage, Jesus is giving a great compliment and an even greater responsibility. He refers to himself as the light of the world, right? Several times through scripture. But Jesus did not challenge us to become the salt or light of the world. He said, you are. He said, you are the salt and light of this world. This means that we're already in this state where we are, we are either fulfilling that role or we are failing that role. And so that responsibility, when we look into ourselves, sometimes we have this tendency, right, where we may fall into this trap of telling ourselves that we would do more if we were just in a different position of our life. And when we do this, the problem with that is that we're negating the very core 
of Jesus' plan to spread his gospel. But the great news I have for you today is this, our second key point. You don't have to change your circumstances to change the world. That's the good news, right? As I said earlier, you are God's plan A. You are God's plan A. What did God say to Jeremiah? He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Your life did not begin in your mother's womb or at the moment of conception. Your life existed in God's mind before your mother even met your father. How powerful is that? God knew you already. God had a plan for you. He knew what your proclivities would be. He knew the ways that you would suffer. He knew the ways that you would find victory. He knew all these things. And he knew you before any of your parents' plans, even before that came into motion, his plan was already working to bring you to this moment so that you would fulfill your role in his plan for our lives. And God tells us this, not to overwhelm us or to frighten us. He tells us this to encourage us. He tells us to encourage you. Well, I have a plan for you. You just need to follow it. You don't need to change. Don't worry about your role. Don't worry about your position. Just follow my plan. This is the same creator of the universe who knows each star by name, who created the mighty lion. It says in scripture that the mountains bow before him. And he adores you. He wants to spend eternity with you. And so if you are filled with hope, love, and forgiveness, then you're already fulfilling your responsibility in his plan. That's all he asks of us. But in these moments where we're filled with regret and we're filled with pride and ego, envy, that's, when how, that's how we know we are failing our roles. See, we often, myself included, we often talk about our belief in God, about how powerful that is, right? I have such a strong belief in God. But I think we don't talk enough about the fact that he has belief in us. He has confidence in us. We ought to take a few moments to share that word with other people. It's not a, this is not a one-way relationship, right? And so it's just worth recognizing that fact, that he believes in you. He trusts you. He has confidence in you. He wants you to turn away from your sin so that you can surrender to him, not because of his ego, but simply because his plan is so much better than ours. God has confidence in your ability to spread the gospel. You don't have to go to seminary to learn how to do that. And it doesn't matter if you are um, a painter or a chef, a nurse, a grocery store clerk. You know, these are various kind of jobs, right, that they may impress the world. They may impress your friends. They don't impress God. I'm sorry. What you do, your occupation, that's not what impresses God. Are you a nurse or a clerk that is filled with love, that shares hope, that shares generosity? Or are you one of these people that you go to work 9 to 5 and you're just waiting for that, that, that 5 o'clock just to clock out, to be done with it all? And meanwhile, you're kind of going through it just with this frown on your face. You're feeling miserable. You feel like, I don't want to be here. If only I were promoted, I'd be so much happier, right? Then I would share the gospel. Then I would start telling my coworkers and my closest friends about what God is doing in my life. See, our, our ministry... <clears throat> our ministry is to be so filled with love that other people come to us wanting to know more about what makes us be like that. What is the truth behind our attitudes? Why do we feel such a, a, a burden to find joy in life despite all the hardships that may be going on in our lives or in the lives of others? The challenge is don't wait for that promotion don't wait for, that, for the escrow to close. Don't wait for that person you like to message you back. Today, we're going to put down our timelines, and we're going to trust in his. 
we're going to trust that his plan is so much superior to ours that we have no choice but to step into this sense of fulfillment and contentment. If we turn to uh, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and this is a long one, so bear with me. Chapter 7, <clears throat> verses 17 through 24, it says this. This is concerning change of status. It says, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule laid down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each person should remain in this situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's free person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Paul is reiterating something here. He's reiterating what, that Jesus came to say that there's nothing to do with, this has nothing to do with trying to change your, uh, your circumstance or your vocation or your status. His response is remain right where you are with God. And I think we would all do well to reflect on this daily, our third key point. God can work through you exactly where he's placed you. See, how, how does it feel to be God's plan A? What's it like to realize that there's no backup plan? If we take a moment, we just kind of zoom out from our lives, right? We begin to see that his plan is so much bigger than just ourselves. It's this beautiful tapestry where all eight billion of us on this planet, we all have a part to play in this plan. And the reality is that when we realize this, we know that God doesn't want to use us in spite of our position in life. He wants to use us exactly in our position. See, we don't want to wait for someone else, right? One of our core eight values here at South Hills is this. We won't wait for someone else to reach our neighbors. And if you haven't um, done Discover already, I would truly encourage you to do that because that's where you'll learn about some of our values. We're not going to wait for someone else with a different role with a different watch, with a different car, with a different name tag, with a different position, at a different age of life, different experience, different marital status. We're not going to wait for th these people to reach our neighbors. The best way that we can step into our roles is to simply become an inviter, right? Invite people to see what God is doing in your life. And there's no better way to do that than to Invite them to a Sunday at South Hills. Don't worry about the way you're dressed, what you ate that morning, what you're going to be doing tomorrow. Just take a moment, right? Take a moment to go reach out of your way and invite someone else. And so I want to give you, I want to challenge you to take 60 seconds right now, right now. And we're going to write down the names of three people. And I wrote three people. I'm going to change it to Five people, because that's what Pastor Ali said, right? Five people. And we'll put it this way. Three people you like, maybe two that you don't like so much. Okay? We're, and to write down these names, invite them to Easter. And until that day comes, we're going to pray for them each and every single day. We're going to do our part of the plan, and we're going to trust that God's going to do his part. Right? So right now, just take 60 seconds. 
And you can write this on a paper, you can write this on your phone. <laughs> this is something that we can all do. Because I know that even for the most introverted of introverts, there are people in your life that God wants you to speak to. And like I said, maybe, you, maybe you're fond of them. Maybe you can't stand them. But they're in your life for a reason. And, th- and this is why his plan is so much better than ours. Because if, it, if everything was according to my plan, I would be surrounded by people who, who think like me, who act like me, who want the same things like me. And yet I find that maybe the most powerful moments of growth and challenge for me are the people who don't see eye to eye with me on anything. And I would think, and I'm sure you would agree, those are the people who need God the most. These five people that we're going to be praying for, let's let's start right now. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity, for this moment that you've created, Lord. We thank you, God, because all the things that we have, all the things that we get to experience, Lord, none of it comes from us. None of it comes from us. They're all blessings that you have given us, Lord. And the reality, Lord, is that you challenged us. You created us for a purpose, and that purpose is simply this. To share these blessings with others. And it's hard. I know it can be very difficult for some of us. Some of us want to, we're backseat drivers and we just want to take control of the wheel. (laughs) We're passengers and we're trying to change every single setting that's available to us. We want to be comfortable. But you're calling us out of that comfort for something so much better than comfortability. See, what we did, it's not an equation, it's not some magic trick, it's not a ritual. But there's reason behind it. There's a reason why those names that popped into your head, those names that you sensed on your heart, there is a very specific reason. Those are the people that came to you first. And maybe it's someone who has been walking with God for so long. Maybe it's someone who has never stepped foot into a church before. But those people that came to your mind, that came to your heart, those are the people God wants you to speak to. Simply invite them. Just give them an invite. Just say, hey, you know, you can come, come with church with me. Let's get some coffee after. Let do your part. God is going to do his. Father, again, I just thank you for this beautiful world that you've created, Lord. I thank you, God, for giving us opportunities to come before you in repentance, Lord. And Father, even though we fail because we are not perfect beings, including myself, you have given me so many opportunities to pick myself back up and lean into you, Lord. And that's what has given me the ability to understand, Lord, that it's not just about my faith in you. It's about your faith in me. And I just thank you for that reality, Lord. And I just pray over this church. I pray over South Hills Riverside. I pray over this community, Lord. That what you're doing here, God, would be known to so many others. So many others that desperately need reprieve. That desperately need to know what your love is. So would you use us, your plan A, to share that with others around us, Lord. In Jesus' holy name.
Amen. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that He's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because the Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that He can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.